All righty, good to see you in church tonight. And um, I was a little bit late. Urban Meyer was talking to me on the phone, <laughs> getting some advice about his future. If you believe that, I have property I want to sell you somewhere. But uh, it's good to be in church tonight. Good to see you this evening. Looking forward to a good service together. Take your Bible, if you would, please, and go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. You helped me a little bit on this, Jimmy, all right? Because my voice isn't quite up to par. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We begin with verse number 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here this evening. And Lord, as we once again look at these verses and understand how we can be effective at helping people who have been taken captive by the devil at his will, to help them to recover themselves out of the snare, And Lord, tonight I'm aware that as we look at the particular verses and phrases of these verses that we'll look at this evening, that we're not only dealing with those of us who might try to help someone, but Lord, we're dealing with some of us who are in that snare ourselves. And we can get instruction tonight about how to get out of that. Lord, those in the room tonight that are opposing themselves, Lord, what they can do to stop opposing themselves and get the victory that you desire for each of us. And so, Father, open our understanding. Holy Spirit, be our helper and teacher as we study your word together this evening. It's in Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. We've been focusing on the things that make us effective at helping people who have been ensnared by Satan. But now we're going to talk a little bit tonight about the captives, those who are in the snare, if you will. And the Bible uses an interesting phrase here. It says that in meekness we're instructing those that oppose themselves. You ever wondered about that about somebody? You ever look at someone and think, why are they doing that? It's self-destructive. It's self-defeating. It's not helping them at all. Uh, They're just acting in a destructive way. It's just ruining their life. Why are they doing that? And yet, other than someone getting saved, there's nothing quite as wonderful as seeing someone who's opposed themselves recover and recover themselves out of the snare of the devil and begin to live for God. That's a wonderful thing. And you understand, when that happens, that never happens without a fight. There's always a battle that goes on with that. There's opposition both from Satan and from the person who's in captivity. The person who's in the snare, sometimes they fight you. Just like a lifeguard going out to rescue someone who's drowning, they have to almost wait until the person is helpless because they can fight the one trying to rescue them. And oftentimes that's the case spiritually as well. There's internal and external opposition. There's disagreement. There's division. Friction sometimes comes into our relationships. Maybe a friction between a parent and a child. Could be a friction between an employee, an employer. Could be a friction between neighbor to neighbor, or friend to friend, or church member to church member. And it's easy to pass blame onto someone else. That started all the way back in the beginning. When they wanted to, Adam wanted to blame Eve, and or Eve wanted to blame Adam, and then they both wanted to blame the serpent, and it's been going on ever since. But here's the 
instruction that God gives us on how we can recover those that oppose themselves, that are ensnared by Satan. And first of all, we have to ask ourselves, what is it? What, what is it that, make, what, what does it mean they oppose themselves? And first of all, I think what it means is this, they cannot make good decisions. They cannot make good decisions. The word here, opposing themselves, is a set of words that is only used here and nowhere else in the New Testament. It's a combination of words that literally means anti-choose or anti-decide. In other words, they're unable to make a decision. In other words, the person who is opposing themselves has a divided mind. He has a, I guess you could call it double mind. Remember James says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Sometimes you're, you, you'll, you'll realize you're wrestling about something and, and they say, well, I'm, I think I'm going to do this and the next minute they're not going to do it. And tomorrow they're going to do it. Next day they're not going to do it. And they're back and forth and they can never make a good decision. And I want you to notice when, when they're in this situation, it's a, first of all, it's an internal conflict. It's an internal conflict. How many know what Amos 3 and verse 3 says? Okay, Brother Bowman? Can two except they be agreed? Can two walk together except they be agreed? And so we, we find out when we oppose ourselves, there's a, there's a dilemma that's going on inside of us. That's the, that's the difficult part of it. And Amos is reminding us that we can't walk with someone that we don't have an agreement with. Now, understand, if that someone is somebody outside of me, then it's very simple. I don't want to be around them anymore. But what do you do when that someone lives inside of you? Now what do you do? You, you can't get away from them. They live, they live inside of you. And so it's an internal conflict. And you can't get away from someone that's, that's your own heart and your own mind. Where do you go? In fact, it's, it's, it's illustrated in 1 Kings chapter 18. And if you remember 1 Kings 18, that's where Elijah is confronting the prophets of Baal and the people of Israel. He calls for the meeting up on Mount Carmel to judge who is really God. They're going to each offer a sacrifice and whichever God answers by fire, He's the real God. And they take the challenge. After all, Baal is known as the fire God. This ought to be a piece of cake for him. Alright? And so they take on the challenge. And Elijah gets up on the mountain, he looks out at Israel, and he says, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, serve Him. And if Baal be God then serve Him. Now, when He says you're halt between two opinions, that doesn't mean you're stopped. Halt means you're crippled. That's the Bible usage of the word halt. And so they were crippled between two opinions. They, 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 they wanted to follow both God and Baal. And you cannot do that. Jesus said no man can serve two masters. He didn't say it isn't good to serve two masters. He didn't say it's not wise to serve two masters. He said you cannot serve two masters. It's impossible. If you try to do both, you're going to be ensnared by Satan. When you oppose yourself, you become double-minded. Double-mindedness brings instability. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, James says. So we're unstable in all our ways. So those who oppose themselves, you know what? They'll have a pattern of instability in every area of their life. Nothing dependable, nothing faithful, nothing steady, nothing regular. 
And all they could do and all they ought to do for the Gospel is hindered because of that. Double-mindedness. So I think when you say, what is it, and they can't make a good decision, you have to realize it's an internal conflict. But it's secondly, B on your paper there, I think it's, it's a blurred vision. They don't see clearly what it is they should do. Look at Matthew chapter 6 with me, would you? Keep your finger there in 2 Timothy. And look with me at Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6, you'll recognize, is part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says in verse 22, Matthew 6 and verse 22, The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thy eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. So God is telling us here something about our eyes. You know your eyes are designed to work together. You know, you, they focus so you can have good vision. What happens when your eyes don't focus? You're in trouble. What happens if one eye looks one way and the other eye looks the other way? You're in trouble. <laughs> my, my dad as many of you know, was a pitcher in the Cardinals organization and in spring training of 1953 had his eye knocked out by a line drive. Um, it was a spring training game and the guy hit a line drive. Those of you who play baseball at all, it was a, it, he hit a line drive off the bat, but it was a knuckleball. It didn't have any spin on it, and so it was going around. And my dad got his, his glove up. He's a lefty. He got his glove up, but it tipped off the top of his glove and right into his eye. And... Um, he ended up losing that eye. So my dad always had a plastic eye that he would nightly take out. And uh, he would had some solution, he would put it in and such. But sometimes he would take it out and wrap it in a hanky or something, put it in his pocket. Sometimes he'd take it out and put it on the sink in the bathroom. <laughs> I remember his kids saying, better brush your teeth, dad's watching. <laughs> you know? So keeping an eye on us, you know? But one thing my dad struggled with was that with one eye was that depth perception. Couldn't tell how close things were and such. And that's why when he tried, he actually tried to come back as a pitcher, and, but when he would throw too hard, that eye would pop out of his head. That'd be great to bat against that, wouldn't it? But, uh, so he took it out and put it in his pocket, but when they would bunt, he couldn't judge the, the distance or how, how it was, and so he ended up retiring from baseball. But you understand, it had a, he had a hard time seeing anything clearly then. So what, what's, what's the Lord saying? Listen, a one who's, the one who is opposing themselves have a difficult time seeing clearly what God wants them to do. They're always debating back and forth what it is that God wants me to do. They, they lose their single focus. Their vision becomes blurred. And they do things that are opposite of what God would want them to do. And they hurt themselves. They hurt themselves. Any, mark it down. Anytime you're doing something opposite of what God says you're to do, you're hurting yourself. And you're opening yourself up for the snare of Satan. Look at Matthew 12 and verse number 25. If you're still in Matthew, turn over a few pages to Matthew 12. Again, Jesus said, verse number 25, And Jesus knew their thoughts, and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. Can I tell you, what's true of a house, what's true of a kingdom, is true of an individual. An individual divided against himself cannot stand when you're and by the way that's what understand the only one who can be double minded is a believer we are we are a three part being what are we church we are spirit soul and body 
Every, every saved individual, spirit, soul, and body. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God said, the day you eat that tree, you'll surely die. They didn't die physically. Their body was still there. Their soul didn't die. Their spirit died. And every man since then, every woman since then that's been born, is born with a soul and a body, but a dead spirit. Well, what, what needs to happen to that spirit? That spirit needs to be made alive. It's the spirit of man that communicates with God. God's spirit communicates with our spirit. His spirit communicates with our spirit that we are the children of God. Okay? It's our spirit that communicates with God. And so that's why the natural man, the one who just has soul and body, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he can't understand the things of God, neither can he know them. He's spiritually discerned. He's spiritually disabled. Why? His spirit's dead. What happens when you get born again? You have to be quickened. You know what the word quickened means? What does it mean? Made alive. You have to be made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Sins and trespasses, Ephesians 2 verse 1. What gets quickened, what gets made alive, what gets born again when you're saved is your spirit. And once you're born again, now your spirit comes alive and you are now spirit, soul, and body. Now, listen, follow me. Before that spirit comes alive and you're a lost person, you know how you lived? You lived with your soul in charge. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. All right, what I think, what I want, what I feel. What I think, what I want, what I feel. How does the average lost person live? Doing what I think, what I feel, what I want. That's how I live. And my body obeys my soul. But now wait a minute. I get born again and that Spirit comes to life. The Spirit is listening to God's Spirit. His Spirit bears witness with our Spirit. Okay? So He's telling me what God, what God says is right, what God says is not right. See, with what God wants, what God thinks, what God feels. Now, I have a choice to make. Do I still follow the old manager, my soul? What I think, what I feel, what I want? Or do I follow the new management, my Spirit? who's telling me what God wants, what God feels, and what God's thinks. And what happens is, we get double-minded. And we make statements like, well, I know the Bible says this, but I just think, well, I know God says we should do this, but I just feel. And we're struggling double-minded in between what I want, what I think, and what I feel, and what God wants, what God thinks, and what God feels. And as long as you do that, you'll never be what God wants you to be. You're in His snare. You're double-minded. You're double-minded. That's an awful place to be. You make no progress when you're double-minded. Paul went through that. Look at Romans chapter 7. Look at Romans chapter 7. Are you okay? Right, you're kind of looking at me like... Romans 7. Notice what Paul writes here in verse 14. He says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. Then go down to verse 20. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. And he's, he's, he's pretty miserable. He said in verse 23, well, first of all, verse 22, he says, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. After that inward man, that inward man is the Spirit of God in us. He said, you know what he delights in? He delights in the law of God. He delights in doing what God wants. And, and there's that, that, that part of us, our spirit, that wants to do what God wants. And then he says, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity What's captivity? That's a prisoner. That's being in a snare. And to the law of sin which is in my members. What does he say? Oh, wretched man that I am! Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He's pretty miserable. You, you don't ever want to live in Romans 7. I mean, if you read that and you say, man, that's me. Hey, get out of Romans 7. Well, where do you go? You go to Romans 8. That's where you go. And, and you look at Romans 8. Notice what he says. 
There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free. Oh, he's not a captive anymore. He's free from the law of sin and death. For what the law couldn't do, that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemns sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh. I don't take repeated steps after the flesh, what I want, what I think, what I feel, but I take repeated steps after the Spirit, what He wants, what He thinks, what He feels. And that makes me free. So the cure for this double-mindedness, the cure for the opposing yourself is spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity. You, you can't hardly believe that the same guy who wrote chapter 7 wrote chapter 8. But of course, the Holy Spirit gave him the words to write. When, when listen, when our mind and our heart are in harmony with God's will and God's Word. And we're listening to what the Spirit tells us to live by. And we're, we're, we're listening to the new manager, so to speak, instead of the old manager of ourself. There's a peace and a harmony that comes into our soul. And you say, man, this is, this is wonderful. That's why the Bible says it's the peace of God that passes all understanding that will keep your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. There's a wonderful peace that comes. You're, you're protected from the vulnerability of double-mindedness and being ensnared by Satan. You see, there's a law in every one of us, and we understand the, the law that he's talking about here isn't the Old Testament law. He's talking about there's a law like, like the law of gravity. Okay? Thank God for the law of gravity. We'd all be floating around and it would be a mess. All right, So gravity keeps us down. Gravity simply says whatever goes up comes back down. Okay, I'm simplifying it, but that's basically what, it, what it's talking about. And it keeps us grounded. You know, I'm always amazed at, at, the, at the huge airplanes. You know, when you fly overseas, you get on a big airplane. And there's, there's 300 people in there. And, and they all got luggage. Not only they put luggage underneath, they, everybody carries stuff on. In fact, many times, I've been on many flights, I'm sure these guys who travel much more than I do, you know, they got to ask people to check those bags and, you know, they'll have them up on the runway when they get done, but they can't, they don't have enough room in the overhead compartment. So I'm thinking, this, this thing is so big and, and it, all this weight, are we going to get off the ground? And, and I, I, I looked some stats up. A 747 jumbo jet is 231 feet 6 inches long, and it has a 211 and 3 inch wingspan. Fully loaded with 60,000 gallons of fuel, it will fly over 7,000 miles at 35,000 feet at a speed of 570 miles per hour. And it weighs, are you ready? 950,000 pounds. Wow. How does that get off the ground? How does that work? You know how it works? There's another law. This is called Ber Bernoulli's law. It's the law of Bernoulli. It says it overcomes the law of gravity. And it causes that plane to lift. And it supersedes the law of gravity. Otherwise, it would be humanly impossible to get that much weight off the ground, let alone get up to 35,000 feet and stay there for seven, eight, nine hours, sometimes longer. And we want it to stay all the way to its runway, amen? <laughs> it's, it's phenomenal. But listen, Listen, the law of sin and death that's in every human being, every sin has its origin in our heart. The heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. 
We have that law of sin in every one of us. But wait a minute. That law of sin and death has been overcome by a greater law. That greater law is the law of the Spirit of life. And I that, that supersedes the law of sin. So listen, I don't have to succumb to that law anymore. There's a greater law. I don't have to be pulled down by that law of gravity. I can live by this life of the Spirit and rise above that. Every Christian can have that. You don't have to be double-minded. You can walk in obedience to God and be wholehearted for God and have a heart that desires to please Him. And you can soar above the sin that wants to pull you down. Every Christian can do that. Amen, preacher. Amen. That's good. Now if I do the teaching and the amen, and it'll be a while, okay? So you do your part and I'll try to do mine, all right? If you're in an internal struggle, some of you tonight, you're having an internal struggle. You know why? You're allowing things in your life that you know God says are flat out wrong. And you're letting them in anyway. Whatever reasoning you use, whatever excuses you come up with, whatever, sometimes we try to defend them by comparing ourselves to somebody else. Well, yeah, I mean, I have this, but I'm not as bad as they are. Or I'm not as bad as, look at him, I'm not as bad as he is. And we kind of make a comparison. But you can, you can try to argue yourself. I had somebody I talked to today. They've been out of church for a month. And been around the wrong people. And I, I told that person flat out, I said, you're not right with God. You're away from God, you're not doing what's right, and you're a mess. Aren't you glad, aren't you, glad you don't come counsel me, with me? <laughs> and, uh, and listen, he tried to defend himself. No, 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 I, I, I'm, I'm still good, I'm, I'm, I'm all right. And then a little bit later in a conversation, he said, you know, about two weeks ago when I was reading my Bible, he said, and that's the last time I did read my Bible was over two weeks ago. Oh. So maybe things aren't so good with you and God as you said they were. See? You can, you can always try to mask it, always try to cover it up, always try to make excuses for it, but you have to face it. And realize, I, I, if God says something's wrong, it's wrong. And it needs to get out of my life. No matter what I am, no matter what I say, I'm not going to argue myself into being disobedient to God. That's a frustrating way to live. Don't live that way. The real, your real reason for being here. Why, why, is God, why does God have you here? Why are you breathing His air and drinking His water and walking on His dirt? There's a reason for that. There's a purpose for that. But you'll never know what that is if you walk in disobedience to Him. You'll be frustrated and, and have no satisfaction or enjoyment of life. What you got to do? Yield to God. You don't try harder. You yield. You yield to what God wants to do in you and through you. It's God which works in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Get out of the way and let Him do it through you. Yield to Him. You know the issue. So you have to admit you're wrong. You have to admit you're wrong and you have to say, God, you're right. You know, you can't free anybody else from the snare until you're free yourself. So you have to get free. So the next step, number three, the next step is repentance. Repentance. If, if those who are ensnared ever to be free, they have to repent. Now, repentance is, is not difficult. It's, it's not complicated. It's 
It means to change your mind. Change your mind. No one ever does differently until they think differently. You'll never consistently live right until you consistently think right. You know, Satan is the deceiver. Jesus said he's a liar and the father of lies. He's a master at it. And he has many of his children in the world that are very good at lying as well. And like to spread those lies. And when you begin to debate Satan about his lies as opposed to God's truth, you're going to be in his snare. He is, he is very subtle. That was, that was Eve's mistake. She thought she could have a conversation with him about it. Yeah, if God said, let's talk about this thing God told you about. Ah, did he really mean what he said? You won't surely die. You see, she got in that conversation. You're in trouble when you begin to discuss God's word with Satan. You don't, listen, when Satan attacked Jesus after fasting for 40 days, Jesus never discussed the scripture with him. He just quoted the scripture to him. And said, it is written. And, and rebuked him with God's word. You see, what the devil loves to do is change the way you think about God, about God's word, and about obeying Jesus Christ. Debating the devil will lead you in a direction in your life. What direction you go determines your destination. And the direction that the Satan will lead you in will not take you to the destination you want to end up at. Eve listened to Satan and got Adam to do the same. How did that... That was the direction they took. How their destination end up? They got thrown out of the garden, didn't they? Couldn't go back in. The devil always promises freedom, but he only delivers slavery. Stop before slavery leads you to destruction. What do I do? Repent. Repent. Change the way you think. You're transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's literally the repairing of your mind. You're re rewiring your mind to think differently than what you've thought before. Number four is how do we bring about repentance? All right? How can I change my mind, in other words, okay? The way to change your thinking is to saturate yourself with the truth. A steady diet of truth. That's why coming to church faithfully and, and hearing the truth is vital to your Christian life. No substitute for it. It brings you back to what God says is right and the way God says you ought to live. What God says has eternal value and purpose. Don't miss that. The reason we have so many professing Christians that are in the snare of Satan, debating God's Word with Satan, being double-minded, is we have devalued the teaching and preaching of God's Word in our churches. Our churches have become places of entertainment. Places where we want to come and make me feel good. There's a big movement that started years ago by a fellow in California when, when he sent out postcards throughout his community asking the community, what do you want in church? 
He said, I got the postcards back, and you know what? None of them said they wanted organ music, so we got rid of the organ. Nobody said they wanted hymns, so we got rid of the hymns. You know what they wanted? They, they, they wanted, some wanted country music, some wanted rap music, some wanted, and that, that guy there now has four different buildings, and every Sunday you come, and they'll meet you in the parking lot, and they'll give you a folder, and you choose which building you want to go to based on the music you want. Oh, they got thousands that come. He says you have to give the people what they want. No wonder we we have so many more what they call mega churches. That that those that's a church that runs two thousand or more every Sunday. We have more than ever before. But our country is more wicked than it ever has been. That that doesn't make sense, does it? It does if you feel if you realize when you go to a service, there's an hour or hour and fifteen minutes or hour and a half of singing and music and there's a 12 to 15 minute message. When the people walk in and and nobody has a Bible. One thing that the folks over here ought to see when they see you park and walk into church, they ought to see everybody carrying a book in their hand and say, boy, they, they they must use the Bible in that church. D.L. Moody used to say, you carry your Bible and walk a mile to church, you preach a sermon that's a mile long. It's true. The focus has to get back to the teaching and preaching of the Word of God. We need it. Not just for church, but guess what? You need it in your daily life. Every day you need God's Word. You've heard me say, the people are, you've heard me say before that the Bible says in Psalm 1 that we... Uh, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Meditate is to continue to go over it. It's, that, it's the cow who brings up that food again and, and, and chews his cud. It's, it's you chewing over again what you read in the morning or what you, what you heard in church or what some would, some, the verse of Scripture and you're going over that again in your mind. How often do I got to do that? Just day and night, that's all. The rest of the time's yours. Do you understand? You say, wow, nobody can think about the Bible all the time. You take that up with God. That ought to be always a thought in our mind. Always something that we're, we're comparing it to. I want my thinking to line up with God's thinking. That's what we need. Finding out what God says brings me to repentance. Because guess what? God's always right, and I'm wrong. I can never say, well, God, I think you missed it here. <laughs> really? Never happens. I'm the one that needs correcting. Look in the book of Philippians with me, would you please? Philippians chapter 4, most of you know this verse. The Bible says here, Paul says, finally brethren, Philippians 4 and verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, do what, church? Think on these things. What am I thinking on? True, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report. There's going to be virtue and he prays. I've got to think on these things. Listen, right thinking leads to right living. It'll put me in the right direction. And the right direction will get me to the right destination. Phil, you want to get to repentance? You want to get to where you change your mind, change the way you think? Fill your mind, fill your heart with God's Word. 
As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. It's out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. Somebody says, well, I just got a foul mouth. No, you don't. You got a foul heart. Your issue is you need to fill your heart with God's Word. Not your head, but your heart. And you do your heart, you fill your heart when you meditate on God's Word. When you spend time thinking and meditating on the Word of God. It's amazing how many times, and you, you, you think about this, you leave church service, and, and it doesn't matter. A couple of weeks ago, I preached a message, I think it was, was it on Sunday morning about the tongue? Being careful what we say. I wonder how many folks, got, by the time they got in their car and going out to eat after church, said something they shouldn't have said. Talked about someone they shouldn't have talked about. And you want to look and say, didn't you just hear the message? How can you have forgotten it that quick? You see? Or Monday comes and someone says, hey, how was church? Oh, man, it was wonderful. What did your pastor preach on? It's gone. And it's gone because you never thought about it again. You never took time to meditate on it. Think about it. Dwell on it. See? So it gets into your heart. Okay? Your heart has to change before anything else is going to change. And you have to fill your heart with the good. You overcome evil with good. Okay? B, the second thing you do is you have to put a stop to every untruthful influence in your life. You say, what's that mean? If it doesn't fit Philippians 4, 8, it's got to go. You know what something you ought to do? You ought to write out Philippians 4, 8 on a 3 by 5 card and put it right by your television screen. Whatever comes on, say, is this pure? Is it true? Is it honest? Is it just? Is it lovely? Is it good report? If not, there's a little, usually it's a red button and it says off or power, and you hit that and it goes off. Don't need to watch it. So many things that, that we would never allow to go on in our house, we allow it to go on because it comes to a TV screen. You wouldn't let someone in and curse in your house. You wouldn't let someone in and get drunk in your house. You wouldn't let couples come in and go to bed in your house, but you do when you watch them on the TV screen. You have to be willing to get rid of those unholy influences. It doesn't take much of a lie to undo the truth. There's a verse in Proverbs. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it for you. Proverbs chapter 19 and verse number 27 says this. Cease, my son, to hear the instruction that causeth to err from the words of knowledge. Cease. Stop it. Stop listening to things that cause you to err, to go away from the way you know God wants you to walk. Stop making excuses and saying, oh, that, does, that stuff doesn't bother me. Oh, I can, I can see that stuff. I can listen to that stuff, but that won't affect me. Then you and God disagree. And you wouldn't be offended if I took God's side. Do you want, do you want freedom? Do you want to walk in victory? Do you want to experience all that God has for you? And help others to enjoy that life as well. We are in the world, but we're not of the world. Are there any lies you're allowing in your life? How much truth are you putting in to your life compared to lies? 
stay with the truth of God and with people who know the truth. And the truth will begin to change the way you think. And when you change the way you think, you'll change the way you live. Notice our verses again. In meekness, verse 25, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God, peradventure, will give them repentance. Notice, how do you get repentance? You acknowledge the truth. God's right. I'm wrong. I have to change the way I think. I do that by saturating myself with the truth of God. Well, pastor, I don't want to be so heavenly minded. I'm no earthly good. Why don't you try it? I've not yet met anyone like that. Oh, I've met quite a few that are so earthly minded, they're no heavenly good. Uh, I'm not I'm sure I've met anybody the other way yet. I sure would like to try that though, wouldn't you? Let's let's make sure that before we recover others, we recover ourselves. Amen? Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, take now the truth that we've looked at this evening. Thank you for the instruction here that you had Paul give to his son in the faith, Timothy, and consequently give to us this evening. And I pray, Lord, tonight you'd help each of us not to oppose ourselves, not to be double-minded, not to have that internal conflict. But I pray that we would yield ourselves to the Spirit of God, the new manager in our life. We would not be double-minded. We would say, this is what God wants, and I'll yield to the Spirit and say no to what I want, what I think, what I feel, and yes to what God says. Change our thinking that we may change the way we live that whether we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, we could do all to the glory of God. And we could fulfill the purpose for which you've placed us on this earth. Make us that kind of a people at Bible Baptist Church. And I'll thank you, Lord, for what you'll do in each one of our hearts and lives. Dismiss us now with your care, Lord. Thank you for our church. Thank you for people who gather together in the middle of the week where the only attraction is we'll sing some songs of, of God and we'll study God's Word together. Help us to live the Bible we've learned this evening. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.